to grasp the invisible. Images and symbols provide a way to unlock higher levels of understanding. Self-knowledge requires a dive into the unseen, yet effectual world within. At first glance, this alchemical pelican seems simplistic, but a deeper view provides it life in its transformational nature. I welcome you to a lecture on the philosophical pelican. We begin with our source in the 17th century. An anonymous alchemist wrote a 1659 treatise, Tractus Aureus Hermetus, translated the Golden Treatise of Hermes, in which this image is found. The alchemist introduced the image, writing, Let all be one in one circle or vessel, for this vessel is the true philosophical pelican, nor is any other to be sought after in all the world. While this symbol can be found throughout Jung's collected works, specifically in Ion and Mysterium Canotiones, I was able to find a copy of the original Scolia online. The only problem is that it is in Latin, so my translation may be a bit off from the original. With that said, I believe the essence is there. Before presenting the image, the alchemist writes something along the lines of, and without this, the philosophical pelican, Every forger alchemist will work in vain, but in order for this material to be better understood in the manner in which they are dictated, it was decided to assign the following figure. This is what separated the true alchemist from the forger, and with that you see the importance not only of an image or figure, but of this specific kind of vessel. And no, it is not an actual pelican, which will make sense later on. But this is the philosophical pelican. Notice its nature, both as a whole and piece by piece. The anonymous alchemist writes, A is the inside, as it were the origin, and source from which the other letters flow, and likewise the final goal to which all the others flow back, as rivers flow into the ocean, or into the great sea. The pelican's parts. The centerpiece and main feature of this image is the ocean in which all are one. This is a paradoxical space that has been given many names throughout the ages and across culture. From the Gnostic Pleroma to the beyond, the alchemical Prima Materia, the void, the Unus Mundus, the realm of potential the beginning and the end, the number zero, the yin and yang, the Ouroboros, and in Jungian psychological terms, which we'll focus on in this lecture, the unconscious. Out of this unconscious arises four discriminating lines. This is highlighted by a quaternio of the letters B, C, D, and E, signifying a separation of the united contents into its parts or elements. Alchemists use the four fundamental elements, fire, air, water, and earth, as one such example of the separation. This is an allusion to order and the balancing of opposites, as many symbols and stories connect this nature with the number four. In all, this second circle resembles consciousness, as opposed to the inner, united, unconscious. Finally, to have a separation between the unity that arises to the quaternio which unfolds, there must be two final labels. F and G highlight these as the above and below, or conscious and unconscious planes. The alchemist writes, together, the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G clearly signify the hidden magical number seven, an important number to the alchemist towards the hidden. Additionally, this number seven can be found in a mysterious way across time and culture. For example, the Christian seven deadly sins, the Jewish seven lights of the menorah, the seven wonders of the world. Our short-term memory is known to hold plus or minus seven items of information. The seven heavens of the Quran, the seven higher and seven underworlds in Hinduism. The newborn Buddha rises and takes seven steps in Buddhism. Sevens and a jackpot on a slot machine, the seven planetary gods in ancient times, 
the seven chakras, the seven days of the week, and the seven alchemical operations. It is interesting to note that together this vessel adds up to the magical number seven, which I will leave its meaning for one to extract from the various examples above. This leads us to the symbolism of the pelican, which helps unlock its meaning. But before a quick recap on the specific parts. A represents the unconscious, the prima materia and lapis, which is the spirit macrelius, the united and undifferentiated. B and E represent the four elements, fire, water, air, earth, which is a quaternio, signifying consciousness, differentiated and separated. And F and G represent the above and below, the corresponding planes of existence. The Alchemical Dissolute Vessel Alchemy is a practice of both spiritual and physical art. One key function of alchemy is the art of transformation, which is performed through operations such as calcination, separation, or coagulation. Distillation is another such alchemical operation. Distillation is a process used to separate a mixture into base elements to purify and then reunite into a renewed mixture. On this process, Jung writes, the purpose of this elation in alchemy was to extract the volatile substance or spirit from the impure body. Back to our image. Out of the prima materia, the volatile substance is extracted into its base elements, and then it flows back into itself after purification. One may notice a rather circular rhythm to this distillation process, which is symbolic of the Ouroboros. This is a key function of the vessel. As Jung writes, the pelican is also the name of a retort, the spout of which runs back into the belly of the vessel. This was the circulatory desolation, much favored by the alchemists. By means of the thousandfold desolation, they hope to achieve a particularly refined result. Physically, this is what the pelican looks like, as you notice that circular nature of the process out of and then back into itself. While this helps us vision it, we're interested in the invisible philosophical pelican. Jung adds, the retorta distillatio ex medio centri, or twisted distillation from the center of the center, results in the activation and development of a psychic center, a concept which coincides psychologically with that of the self. In other words, if the adept, the subject, the ego, you create, find, or develop this mental distillation, this vessel. It activates and develops a psychic center known as the self. This picture is beginning to make sense, and those with knowledge about Jungian psychology will notice the thousandfold distillation of the centered self as a process of individuation. Jung's individuation, or any awakening process, requires this idea of an ongoing purification. Enlightenment does not happen overnight, but through a process of circular desolation, the true one self arises. With this, I want to bring forth another important symbol that one may notice. That is a mandala. Jung remarks, remarkably enough, the psychic images of wholeness, which are spontaneously produced by the unconscious, the symbols of the self in mandala form, have a mathematical structure. They are as a rule quaternities, or their multiples. These structures not only express order, they also create it. We remember out of A arises B, C, D, and E, hence a connection to the pelican and a mandala, signifying a sense of order and wholeness. In addition, in this quote, you notice that the structures are not only expressing order, but also creating it. And it's out of that center where the creation occurs. On this center, Jung writes, the center unites the four and the seven into one. The unifying agent is the spirit Macrelius. On the spirit, he adds, he is metallic yet liquid, matter yet spirit, cold yet fiery, poison yet healing drought, a symbol uniting all the opposites. And it is through this center that brings the whole picture together. An alchemical spirit Macrelius or the Jungian self. The key word throughout this distillation process is transformation. But one question does remain. 
Why the pelican? In the Scolia, the alchemist writes about the pelican, for when she applies her beak to her breasts, the whole neck with the beak is bent into the shape of a circle. The blood flowing from her breast restores life to the dead fledlings. The first idea to note is the shape of the physical vessel, which we've seen previously. It's also in this important alchemical image towards the right, where you see the above quote highlighted. Now, what about this blood flowing and restoring life? This is where I believe the true meaning of the pelican takes shape. It has religious ties, with many connections to Christ representing the pelican, but I want to stay focused in on the blood. It is this blood that is the key to transformation. This blood is from the center, the ocean, which the author to the Scolia alludes to providing the transformational abilities. It also provides life. The pelican draws this life not from outside itself, but rather within. While it may be painstaking to draw the blood, it is from this source that renewal is possible. For those familiar with Christianity, you could see why Christ is connected with the pelican, signifying self-sacrifice. On this, Jung wrote, In alchemy, the purification is the result of numerous distillations. In psychology, too, it comes from an equally thorough separation of the ordinary ego personality from all inflationary admixtures of unconscious material. This task entails the most painstaking self-examination and self-education, which can, however, be passed on to others by one who has acquired the discipline himself. The process of psychological differentiation is no light work. It needs the tenacity and patience of the alchemist, who must purify the body from all superfluities in the fiercest heat of the furnace. Now let's bring all this together as we begin to create and apply the pelican psychologically. creating and applying the pelican. To apply this information, we must first construct the vessel before putting it to use. The formation of the pelican can be found in Jung's work, where he refers to another alchemist, Gerhard Dorn, writing, it's Dorn's view that the vessel must be made by a kind of squaring of the circle. It is essentially a psychic operation, the creation of an inner readiness to accept the archetype of the self in whatever subjective form it appears. Doran calls this vessel the Vas Peliconicum and says that with its help, the Quinta Ascentia can be extracted from the Prima Materia. In relation to the earlier quote about the vessel activating and developing a psychic center, the creation of the vessel begins with the ego's ability, that is your own conscious ability, to begin to open up to and accept the self. While it will require a few lectures to go through this ego development, it is important to note that the formation of the vessel is a process in itself. The ego must be humble enough to open to a higher inner authority while requiring the strength to bear conflicting opposites. With this, let's begin to construct the pelican. We start with the center, small circle. This is the unconscious, while the outer circle again is the conscious. Out of the unconscious, in order to have an order of consciousness, the material is separated into its parts. Sticking with Jung's work, I will place the four conscious functions of thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition to account for the four basic elements. Here we see a correctly constructed pelican. The outer four are separated and connected to the center, and you also notice the rotation from above to below. Before we perform any alchemy and put this to use, I want to provide two quick examples to show an incomplete pelican. The first example is a consciousness that is unconnected to the self. This is a consciousness that is inflated without any self-knowledge. You notice that there is no clear second circle with holes, and any content that arises is projected or rejected. The second example is a consciousness that is developed in three of four functions with a bias towards thinking and an undeveloped feeling function. You see the three circulatory desolations occurring, but the fourth is disconnected. While one may see this example as more expanded and stable consciously compared to the previous, 
it is still incomplete. And at that, it's not capable of its true purpose. On this purpose, the alchemist wrote, reduce your stone to the four elements, rectify and combine them into one, and you will have the whole magistry. This one to which the elements must be reduced is that little circle in the center of the squared figure. It is the mediator, making peace between the enemies or elements. The goal is the one, the self, the philosopher's stone, after purification and some more purification. It is the mediator, the true mediator, which many priests, therapists, and others attempt to fill. With this, you see why the ego must be humble and strong enough to hold the opposites. If the ego becomes the judge, becoming one-sided, or directs it to someone else, you could see how the self can never truly be formed. Again, the self is that true mediator, relating to that above-discussed spirit Macrilius. Back to the image. If the circulations are all in place, there is an order to the chaos, then the self may emerge. Many describe this as awakening, as the self is beginning to be noticed. Awakening, though, is an ongoing process. For example, this self, the stone, is in need of purification initially from personal material trapped in the impersonal. This is known as shadow work, requiring multiple distillations. Jung writes, We could take this, referring to the pelican's distillation, as illustrating the process of conscious realization and the reapplication of conscious insights to the unconscious. Now bringing back in individuation, this is that process of bringing forth the one, one's own self, by holding the opposites in reflection, rather than reflecting oneself through projection or repression. Now to take it all in with the image, let me illustrate. We begin with the creation of the vessel, again out of that ego's development to hold the conflicting opposites and activating a psychic center. Out of the center, the ocean, arises prima materia. The process of conscious realization and reapplication allows for a successful conscious integration and purifying of the self. In the beginning, the self is a bit black and dense and dark, but through the distillations and the purifications, the ultimate goal, a polishing up of a perfectly round stone, a philosopher's stone, is achieved. You see how this all flows together leading towards a picture of self-transformation through an unconscious and conscious interaction, all within this alchemical vessel. That is the power of an image. A final quote from Jung on the Pelican reads, it is the lapis itself, and at the same time contains it. That is to say, the self in its own container. Conclusion. There are three key takeaways with this image. The first is the center, that uniting mediator, the spirit Macrilius or the self. The second is the idea of wholeness, the mandala, and the transformation that occurs between the above and below. And the third being the idea of self-sacrifice, which is required to create the philosophical pelican. And finally, one beautiful analogy in the pelican that came to me while putting this together is the idea of being and becoming. To truly create the vessel, the ego must be in the truest state of being, as it cannot be swayed in one-sidedness. It must remain balanced and hold the opposites, hence that idea of being in the present moment. And then becoming, of course, is that purified self. So our pelican not only represents the mandala and wholeness, a distilling process, a quaternio, the self-sacrifice, the number seven, the conscious and the unconscious, all wrapped up in its hermetic and alchemical makeup, but it also is a symbol of both becoming and being. I hope this example provided some insight on the invisible mental world, as well as some new interest to lead you on your journey of self-realization. Look out for more content on all things mind, consciousness, and Jung in the future. Until next time, stay humble.